Hello, welcome to Miniature Realms, my name's Stuart, and this video is an interview with Robin Dews, formerly of Games Workshop. Now, at the time I started gaming, Robin was the editor of White Dwarf, and I'm sure his input to the hobby had a big impact on my hobby, as well as it did for many of you. He went on to become studio manager as well, and then many other roles afterwards. So it's a really wide-ranging, interesting conversation with Robin about Games Workshop in the 90s and early noughties. We also talk about his book, Talking Miniatures, which he's co-written with John Stallard of Warlord games in which they talk about that era of games workshop as well from the point of view of those who worked in the studio and the business at the time hope you enjoy it well welcome robin thank you very much for coming in and agreeing to talk to me i've been really excited about this and waiting <laughs> eagerly while i've been away traveling around europe looking forward to doing this interview so thank you for coming well, on the show it's, it's a pleasure i mean one of the things that's been great for for me about uh well I could talk about the whole process of, of, of the book and talking miniatures He's actually reconnecting with that bit. You know, this was 30 years ago. It's scary when I sometimes look in the mirror and look back and go, how can that be 30 years ago when, you know, I first started editing White Dwarf and then running the studio throughout the 90s, but it was, and that's what happens. You know, time goes by, you get on with your life and stuff happens. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's been a real joy for me reconnecting with some of those people from the past, you know, people, getting in touch with Mike McVeigh again, who I'd lost contact with for 20 years. And it was just, it's just been great, really great. Yeah, it, it definitely excites me. I've, I've recently read Dice Men. I got it for Christmas. And then I, I think um, I went up to Warlord Games HQ back in November. Um, okay. I was kindly invited up there by by um, John and, and Paul, because I do a lot, a lot of videos for some of their products. Yeah, and, yeah. They um, they mentioned there. I can't remember how it came up. I might have mentioned I got I was getting dice men for Christmas, and that he, John mentioned then that he was doing this. And I figured you had only just started, and it was being miles off. And then suddenly I got the email saying pre orders going up, and I was like, right, order, 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 <laughs> order, order. But um, well, you're right, you're right. Time just flies. You reminded me how long Buzz Lightyear has been out <laughs> in a bit of pre chat a minute ago. Time just just seems to disappear, doesn't it? it but uh... it, it does. But you just get on with it and you just love it and you enjoy it. And actually, it, 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 you know, it's been a fantastic trip back for me into that past. And actually, you know, it's not the first thing looking. I mean, there's a there's a few um, Facebook groups that I hang out on. And there's one called White Dwarf through the through the years, 1975 to whatever now. And it's just, I find it amazing. Not, I don't stick my hand up and say, oh, look, I'm here. I'm the big, I am. I used to edit White Door because that's not what the group's for. The group is about fans and enthusiasts getting together and sharing their love of something. But actually, it's a joy for me to see the passion that people have and the memories that have about early battle reports and all of that. And yeah, I've got lots to say about all of that. So when we can get into that subject. So we've got we've got time. So we have definitely. So what we're going to try and discuss today really is talk a lot about White Dwarf, talk about 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 your time as studio manager, and of course, talking miniatures as well. But before we get into the White Dwarf bit, there's obviously a period before that. You didn't just jump straight in as no, White no. Dwarf editor. So talk to us a little bit about your wargaming background. When did you start gaming? And then lead into how you started working for Games Workshop. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, there's no there's no start point. It, it, there's no start point in any of this because it's 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 who you are and what you are. So when I was a kid, I was a kid, you know, I was born in the mid 50s. So it makes me very old now. And so by mid 60s, kind of 10, 11 year old, 11 years, I was an airfix kid because all kids at that time were airfix kids. So you start with a Spitfire and a Messerschmitt and then a and then a Tiger tank and a Sherman. And then you find the little boxes of, of uh, OO scale miniatures and you start to collect those. I absolutely fell in love with um, the world when the Mark I, uh, World War I, for the first tank came out. And I can remember in my, in my bedroom, I built a huge diorama in my bedroom and kind of coiled up lots of barbed wire and made trenches. And my mum and dad weren't very pleased about me <laughs> stopping paper mache on top of the, of the... But I can remember making that and actually buying these Mark I tanks and setting that out. And that was kind of my kind of visual fascination with toy soldiers and tanks and gaming. And then when I was... I, I must have been about 11 years old. I must have been about the same age. 
and actually my brother I had an older brother a couple of years older than me and we used to play games together you know every every birthday or christmas would actually be then back then one of the classic waddington's games whether it was risk or battle a little big horn they were just really great packages of a game in a box but uh, he got hold of a copy of war gamers newsletter he must have been about 13 or 14 a little stapled together pamphlet and in that i saw an advert for a book called charge or how to play war games by um, Peter Young and Lawson, I think. So I trotted off to my local library. I, I grew up in Birmingham, in so a little, a little kind of place called Castle Bromwich on the outside of Birmingham. And I trotted along there. I went to my local library. I said, Miss, can you order this for me, please? And so she had a look and she put in an order. And a couple of weeks later, I got a card and said, look, your, your book's ready. And so I got a hold of that, this book, proper grown up war gaming book. So I saw it. And I then, for the next six months, Every two weeks, I had to go back to the library and say, can I renew this, please? Because she used to go and renew books and she'd stamp my card and give it me back again. And then after six months, she said, I can't renew that anymore. <laughs> Somebody else wants it. But that was my <laughs> intro. And I had a buddy at the time, a guy, guy called Paul, and we used to uh, war game using the, those rules. And we would use the Airfix American Civil War soldiers for... Uh, I think it was Wars of the Spanish Succession. But that introduced me to the whole idea of, of rules and miniatures and doing more with my ethics than just chucking marbles at them or setting fire to them at the bottom of the garden or all the other things <laughs> which used to do with their toy soldiers. So at that point, I became a, a kind of toy soldier gamer. And then, you know, teenage years take over and you're still doing that kind of stuff. And then, and I, and I then moved into, I started playing uh, Avalon Hill stuff, or like hex board games and all of that. And that was just me. That was, that's, that's how I, I characterized myself. Then I went off to university and I did lots of other things and mucked about and played lots of Go and listened to lots of music and did all the, did all the stuff that you don't want to mention to people now that you do. <laughs> um, and then that get, I was at university from 74 to 77. I was down in London at that time. And of course, in 75, Dungeons and Dragons started to appear. And so I, I you know, at that point, I just got into fantasy gaming. So, it, it, you know, the, the, the war gaming kind of was around and I still did it. But then suddenly fantasy gaming became a thing. And I got I fell in love with Dungeons and Dragons and I became a dungeon master and I would devise and run dungeons and do all of that stuff. So I, I was in that world is, is the world that I was in. And then when I left uh, left university in 77, I started working as a youth worker. I'd done a degree in, degree in psychology and I trained as a youth and community worker. And so I was running youth centres in, in South East London. And in one of the things that I introduced into that um, club, my, my youth club, was uh, war games and role playing games. It was perfectly fine. I had these kids who were fairly crazy kids, but I suddenly found that they would be painting miniatures and spending hours and really focusing in on what we were doing. So that was the what I was doing in the early 80s from kind of 83 onwards. And then um, in 88, I w one of the kids in my club said, look, there's a Thames Telethon coming up. They're raising money for charity. Why don't we play a 24-hour Warhammer game? And, so, and we, we, we got table tennis tables. It's a youth club with table tennis tables. And we made loads of scenery for these table tennis tables. And so actually I got together with these kids. And actually what I did was, was I went into Orcs Nest, which is my local store in um, Covent Garden. Two lovely guys had set up this independent store and it was my hobby store I didn't really go to games workshop on uh, oxford street at the time i used to go to orcs nest because they were fun and uh, or, or slightly more fun and i said to them do you know anyone in games workshop and they said well yeah we know a guy called andy jones and i went okay can you give me his address and so i wrote to andy and said i'm a youth worker in london we're doing 24 hour war have a game do you want to send me some stuff? Do you want to support us in any way? And they sent me a lovely big cardboard box with about four editions of Warhammer Third in it, the hardback, and some of those amazing uh, plastic regiment sets that they did at the time with six different armies in. So you had dwarves, dark elves, orcs, goblins. It's my first box. <laughs> That's the first box. And some Warhammer Townscapes. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, the cardboard building sets so yep. they were they were, lov they were lovely and actually they also printed up some uh t-shirts with us that had roundabout youth club and games workshop on them telethon 88 they, they were loved andy was lovely Brilliant. Was happy. andy was really lovely and so we could put all this together we played warhammer for 24 hours got completely zonked out from friday night to sunday morning 
and raise some money. And then I found out Andy at Games Workshop and said, Andy, look, we they've asked us to go on TV because it's a bit weird and quirky and present the check. Do you want to come down? So Andy and Tim Pollard came down to London and they were kept, arrived dressed in their dark future gear. You won't remember this at the time, <laughs> but um, there was a company called Mythlaw that used to make costumes for Games Workshop and they'd made a load, load of dark future gear. So jackets with studs and spikes and helmets and so they rocked up and we rock and we kind of handed over the check and and that's that was my first contact with games workshop then what i did was like that battle that we fought over over the over that couple of days i wrote it up i wrote it up as a battle report and i sent it into white dwarf and said look this is what we did and they published it and i think they published it in 106 or 107 but the month before they published it, I saw an ad in, in the magazine for editors, developers, mm -hmm. wanting people who not necessarily worked in the industry before, but were literate, could write, were articulate, la la la. And I went to Linda, Do you, you, we were living in London. I'd got my first daughter had been born and said, look, should we go and live somewhere else and do something else? And she said, yeah, I'm up for that if you're up for that. And that was it. And so I applied for a job. They published my article in White Dwarf. Uh, I did a couple of interviews. I was asked to, um, the editing test that I was given was called Red Ice. It was converting the Blood Bowl rules to ice hockey. <laughs> and I yeah, had to edit, edit a kind of set of rules. And the movement rules meant that you kind of, when you were moving, you were gliding forward on some kind of vector movement. They were a nightmare. <laughs> that, was, that was my editing test. And as a result of all of that, contact with the company, having something published in White Dwarf, even though you know I'd got no previous track record in the industry, I was off offered a job as an editor developer. And in March '89, I think in March, yes, I rocked up in the design studio, completely starstruck. I was stuck in an office with Jervis Johnson and Rick Priestley and Nigel Stillman and Sean Masterton, and and he went, get on with some stuff and <laughs> given given stuff to do. And that that's how I arrived at Games Workshop in the short but long version. <laughs> so it wasn't all that long then until you ended up jumping from that to to editing you obviously had a, a year or so in between that period but it was it was a couple of years it was a couple of years actually i joined in march 89 and uh i was working in the editorial department and that but you know uh, Rick describes this as kind of work for hire, quick and dirty, done by 5.30. It would be literally, you'd be dumped something on your desk at nine o'clock in the morning that had to be done by one o'clock in the afternoon. So I think the first thing that I did in White Dwarf, and I, I was just looking back recently, you know, while in thinking about this interview, it was something called Storm Riders. I was given a, back, uh, a, a box of plastic skellies with Nigel Stillman. Nigel Stillman had written the rules and they said, okay, we need some background text and we need some uh, color for this put that together and it went into uh white wolf for storm riders by nigel stillman and robin Hughes, and that's what i did and, and it was real kind of like get that done get it up to the editorial department by one o'clock it's got to be it was you know it was it was job and the jobs would just commence miniatures would be put on your table and said okay we need some rules for that or we need some description of that get it done get it out of the editor that was the job of the editorial department at white dwarf at the studio at that time and i was there for about three, four, five, I can't remember, months. And by then, uh, Tom Kirby, who later became chairman and, and led the buyout of Games Workshop, Tom took me to one side and he said, look, he said, you're quite a grown-up compared to lots of the people in the company because the average age was kind of mid to late 20s. And there I was, I was 34. I was married. I had two kids. I used to, you know, go home after work, not go down the pub. <laughs> and <laughs> I was a relative grown-up, let's put it that way. And yeah. Tom said, I think you're much better at organizing people. I'd also had a 10 year career from about 70, less than that, but 70, when I left university in 77, 78 to 83, when I, uh, 89, yeah, 10 years, where I'd run staff teams and I'd managed groups of people and I'd done all, you know, all the stuff that you have to do. And he said, you're actually much better at organizing people than you are writing this text. We can get lots of people to write this text. I want you to go and run the production floor. And the production floor back in Enfield Chambers, Enfield Chambers, it, you know, deserves a book in its own right. It was this rabbit warren of little offices and cart compartmentalized. That corner was the heavy metal painters. There's Mike McVeigh and Sid and Dave Andrews next door to John Blanche on the ground floor. Then there was this office on the middle floor. Uh, there was the editorial office and then the people who were just too crazy. So Hal, Richard Halliwell, had his own little office because he was way too, <laughs> way too bonkers and he was kind of, <laughs> 
often out on the back fire sticks, the fire escape, smoking something that we won't talk about. <laughs> but, um, thinking that the ash wasn't dropping down outside. It, it, it was a crazy, crazy place. The top floor, there were a miniature designers, Jez and the Perrys and Kev Adams, who had his own little room, and Trish and Ali. And, and it was a rabbit warren. And But the production floor, when we're talking production floor, you have to remember here, Stuart, and this is probably difficult, maybe, we didn't have any computers. Yeah. Yeah. The only computers we had were Amstrad PCW 12, I think there were 254, 126s. I think 126s. You have to remember this was a computer made by Alan Sugar and Amstrad that had no operating system. You had to put a floppy disk in it in the morning to boot up an operating system oh, wow. that, that sat in its RAM, take that disk out and put another floppy in. And then you could use a, a program called LocoScript to write stuff in. Right. And there were no computers, no no layout computers. How was the layout done? Gr lines and lines of people with um, pens and <laughs> cow gum and ink and what? I mean, it was it was an entirely manual process. And this is almost impossible for uh, people to understand now who've used to kind of you know desktop publishing and all of that. And around that time, about eighty nine, I think Apple Mac produced the first Mac SE30. It was a tiny little, tiny little machine with a green screen that you could lay out a page of text on and you could leave, it was just uh, magic. Yeah. And as that, so that happened around that same time. So the production floor was a whole load of people manually putting together books again. This is how 40K was done. It was how third was done. It was how second was done. You know, first was done by Rick and Tony Ackland in a little room in Newark with Rick working on a typewriter, typing out big pages leaving holes using the tab controls and then handing that page to Tony Atland who put a drawing on the paper and then that would be photographed and then and printed from that. Yeah. Wow. You're smiling because that <laughs> it, there was no other way of doing it. If, no, we wanted to, if we wanted to put pictures of miniatures, you had to, um, and artwork, we had a big room full of, with red lights, full of smelly chemicals. And you had to photograph them with what was called a halftone screen that would put a dot in front of them. And it was, again, it was an all entirely manual process. There was no scanning. There was no digitization. It was entirely analog and entirely manual. And someday somebody needs to write a book about that as well, because it just feels so weird. It feels like clumping rocks together in the Stone Age by now. But that's the way it was done. So long story, sorry, mate. Um, the production <laughs> floor was where that was happening. And down one end, there was a big, what was called a compugraphic typesetting machine. Mm -hmm. And so all of these files that came out of these cheap little Amstrads were handed to Lindsay Priestley, Lindsay, Rick's wife now. And Lindsay was a typesetter. And by typesetter, she would use um, control codes a bit like HTML codes, right. if you've seen it, to actually say, you know, this bit bold, this bit centered, this bit headed, this font here. And it was all done by control codes because there was no what you see is what you get on screen. No, right. it was, that's how it done. And then that, once you completed that, that would then have to go through another photographic smelly chemical bath to produce what was called a, a, a photo galley. And it was those galleys that were then cut up and laid down on the page. And that's how 40K was done. In fact, every other book and game and miniature prior to this. We'll stop there. Um, so I, I was asked to go and run the production floor because the production floor could kind of only do one thing at a time. Mm. It, could, it couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. And so when the production floor would be working on a product and then White Dwarf would have to be published and all the same people would be putting together White Dwarf. And so the so the whole schedule would fall apart while White Dwarf was done. And then when White Dwarf went out the door, everyone would go back to what they were doing before. And it was just a bit of a nightmare. And so I was just asked to go and do that. And so I ran that production floor probably about 12 months. We, mm -hmm. we the production floor. In that 12 months, we really got to grip with with this new technology, this new technology that Apple introduced into the professional desktop publishing market. And Brian and Brian Ansel, who ran the business, he saw this and he saw an opportunity to um, create a different kind of structure in the studio. So rather than this tiered, so editorial team going up to production team, he said, what we can do is we can create a group of cells, production cells. And in that cell, you can have a games writer or an editor and a layout person and a couple of artists, and you just put them together into group and they will produce things in small teams. 
And actually the first thing that was produced in that way was I think Rick led the team that did um, uh, Slaves to Dark, no, uh, Lost in the Damned. Slaves right. to Dark was already out and Lost in the Damned had got stalled in this process because it just wasn't happening because there was no time because all the other things that got in the way. And Rick using this cell structure of a couple of artists um, and some Apple Macs put together Lost to the Damned. And that was one of the first big uh, products like that. And so once that had happened, um, Brian saw a way forward using that technology. And a lot of the, there was what in the book, the Perry's call it the Fuzzy Felt Massacre. And I won't go into an explanation of that, read it in the book, but all of the production artists, the finished artists as they're called, this is a skilled job. People used to go to college for three years to train how to do that, but it was wiped out by technology and a kind of Luddite rebellion. And these Macs came in and they could do all, they could draw straight lines, they could put out text, they could put pictures in text. Everything that we now know around publishing happened. Um, and so at that point, I wasn't needed as, as a supervisor. So mm -hmm. I was then asked to go to Flame Publications and, and work with Flame. So I went to Flame. Flame had been set up to kind of um, ring fence uh, role playing within the studio. So yep. that the main focus of the studio was on tabletop miniatures games. And so Flame had been set up with Graham Davis and Mike Brunton and Tony Ackland mm -hmm. uh, to produce um, supplements for uh, Woofrook. Mm -hmm. And it was in a separate located building. It was in is up on Derby, Derby Road in Nottingham next to Marauder because Marauder had also been split off from that point from the main Citadel team. So Trish and Ali had their own little business within Citadel called Marauder. It was kind mm -hmm. of a, a brand extension. And so I went to work at Flame and I went to work at Flame uh, probably must have been about 90, 1991 because I left the studio at Enfield Chambers. And while I was up at Flame, it moved to Castle Boulevard, which was its second right, yeah. big home. Um, and I worked at Flame for a while because Mike Brunson had gone to join the uh, gone to Microprose in the computer games industry. Graham had gone to America. And so I was there with Tony and Carl Sargent and me. And we produced a couple of three books. Death Dark, Death Dark Shadow was one of them. Producing books, actually producing books and games. And then Flame, Flame was folded back again. And I was transferred back to the studio and asked to work on the White Dwarf team as an editor developer again and mm -hmm. Cy Forrest who was my direct predecessor on White Dwarf Cy had been with the company for about a year and was White Dwarf editor and uh, in Cy was a, an amazing technical editor he was just incredible facility with language and scary 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 attention to detail but Cy just at one point he just said uh, I'm going to go and do something else this isn't for me anymore and so Tom said to me will you take over White Dwarf Mm -hmm. and and that was in whatever whatever it was it was uh what year is this this is august, august 91 august 91 i think july I'd, I'd been working on white dwarf anyway and so august 91 i became white dwarf editor and at that point i went okay okay i i can do something with this now i i know what's what's needed here i'd also coincided and I will let you take you get a question because I will talk for England. Uh, <laughs> you, you've 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 answered you asked my next question anyway, which was leading into also, this. So. What, what, what had also <laughs> happened in terms of the company at that point is you have to remember Stephen Ian had set up the company, as they say, in Dice Men in, in the mid 1975. By 1983, certainly after the release of Warhammer in 83, the Citadel tale began to wag the Games Workshop dog. Citadel mm -hmm. Newark was where the money was made and Warhammer geared that up and then second edition Warhammer came and the company had moved to Eastwood which was people remember Chewton Street Eastwood mm -hmm. as, the, as on the, all of the boxes and then Brian effectively became by the time I joined in in 89 Brian was the MD he 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 pretty much owned the company I think Stephen Ian still had a small holding but a fighting fantasy had made, been so successful those for those two guys that that was where all their attention was. They were writing fighting fantasy books. And Brian was running the company. And, and then in 1990, Brian, 90, 1991, Tom Kirby, who'd come in from TSR UK, he led a management buyout. He said to Brian, look, Brian, you know, I'd like to buy the company off you if you're prepared to sell. And Brian and they came and these guys, I don't know any of the ins, ins and outs, but they came to a deal and Tom took the company. What was that change about? Well, what that change was about, Brian was just a visionary character. 
Brian knew everything about toy soldiers. He not only was a sculptor and a caster and a mold maker, he wrote game rules, he published Laser Burn. You know, he was an absolutely driven visionary. I mean, the kind of Renaissance man who could do everything. But in the way of people who can do everything, um, the company in a way was artificially small so that Brian could control all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I've said before when I was White Dwarf editor, an issue of White Dwarf would come out and Brian would go home and he'd look through that issue of White Dwarf and he'd talk into a dictaphone and he would go through it page by page by page by page, every page. That note, that dictaphone notes would then be typed into a memo and you would receive a memo. And that memo would tell you absolutely everything that you'd done wrong on every single page. <laughs> And what 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 an idiot you were, and how dare you try and destroy everything that he'd been building up by your stupidity with this <laughs> or with that or with that or with that that. Now no. people say that that was tough, but it was tough. But boy, did you learn fast! Mm -hmm. Boy, yeah, learn. I can imagine. And, and did you know that what standard you were being held to? And that was Brian. Tom was a different guy. Tom knew that Games Workshop had been very successful in the UK, but it could be very successful globally if um, people were let go to do what they wanted. And so Tom was a different kind of boss. Tom, Brian wanted, was was absolutely involved in all the pride, you know, Why the Orcs and Realm of Chaos and all of that, that, all of that flowed out of Brian. Tom kind of went, well, actually the studio is fine because there's John Blanche and there's Rick Priestley and there's a great team of people. There's Jez Goodwin, there's Perry's, there's fantastic sculptures, there's fantastic writers, there's fantastic artists. I don't have to worry about that. It will just yeah. be fine. I can focus on other stuff. And so what Tom then started doing was um, internationalizing the business. So he went to the French people, a woman called Danielle Gaudry, who oh, she had a, the rights to, to um, translate and distribute Games Workshop products in France. And he said, look, stop being a translator, become Games Workshop France. And I think she had a couple of stores in Paris. And so he bought that business and incorporated it into Games Workshop. In Barcelona, in Spain, there were a couple of people, Jaime Molina and Montse, I can't remember her second name, who had a little company called Dizenes Orbit Orbitalis. Uh, and they had two stores in, in Barcelona and they were translating Space Hulk and producing it in Spanish versions of, of Space Hulk and various games. And again, Tom went to them and said, look, stop being Dizenes Orbitalis. Why don't you become Games Workshop Spain? Mm -hmm. And they went, OK, and some money was sure probably exchanged hands, of which I know nothing about. <laughs> but there was about to be some money will have changed hands and suddenly Games Workshop Spain was there. Okay. Right. What's yep. the significance of what's the significance of this? The significance of this is I start, started out as UK White Dwarf editor in 91 or, or with issue 140. Quite rapidly, there was a French white dwarf to deal with. There was then also a Spanish white dwarf to deal with. And quite rapidly after that, because of Tom's vision of a global games workshop rather than the UK games workshop. We got um, a couple of young Italian lads, uh, Luca Mazzelli, I think was the name of one, and I can't remember the other chap. And we just got these two Italian, we put an ad in White Dwarf and said, are you Italian? Do you speak good English? Do you want to work on, on, on Games Workshop products? And we recruited these guys. We put them in, we brought them into the studio, put them in a corner and said, right, start translating that stuff. And very, very quickly, you know, I mean, what what they thought, you know, coming from Italy, Italy, beautiful, sunny, fabulous food to live in, <laughs> in Eastwood <laughs> and working in the studio. Poor sods is what I think now. But they came and they got on with it. And that was the origin of Games Workshop is Italy. And the same thing was with with Germany. In the case of Germany, uh, they rented a um, uh, a warehouse in Glaisdale, which is an industrial uh, estate on the edge of Nottingham, and just filled it full of Germans. They recruited all these Germans, translators, uh, telesalesmen. And so you'd phone this number if you were in Germany, and it would come through this little building on the outskirts of Nottingham, and somebody was answering German, and it became Games Workshop Germany. And after it had been there for a couple of years, incubating, it mm -hmm. was picked up and popped straight back into Dusseldorf. Right. And and that's how the business, same with, same with the Italian business, it was kind of grown, incubated in the UK, uh, taught all of the good habits that we wanted them to have, and then picked up and popped back into, I think it was Rome, they, they went back to there. And, and that's what was happening in the 90s. And that the significance of that is that over the period that I was editing Dwarf, 
from 91 to 95, I kind of became the head of this de facto international product production studio because it wasn't just White Dwarf. All of the product then had to start to be translated. I had the contacts and I knew all the people in the studios. And so in 95, Rick, who'd been the studio manager, was just finding the um, balance between what he loves. And Rick is, Rick is at heart, is a genius games designer. You know, he understands games and mechanics. And one of the things that um, Andy Chambers says in the book, he says what's brilliant about Rick is Rick gets the hook in games. Yeah. He sees that little mechanic or that little thing that makes people go, oh, that's so cool. And that's one of Rick's great talents. And Rick was just finding that balance because Rick was still writing codexes and army books. And he'd written uh, Warhammer 4. And I think he'd also written or so, certainly co-wrote um, 40K2, um, mm -hmm. the first box set that came out. Yep. And he was just finding the responsibilities of managing this growing international business with actually creative game design just too much. And so it, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> it's too much and so um i so they said there's a job for a studio manager and i went i can do that and i said look I, i've got these contacts i know all the people in all the studios across europe and indeed the world because there was a, also a, a u.s edition of white dwarf by that time and so i in 95 i kind of stepped into that role of not that meant rick was responsible for the product development i just had to make sure things happened in the right yep. order at the right time with the right people to to some kind of schedule and that was that was the job that i had and it was just a, such a fabulous job because it, again you know people said to me at the time how do you do this and i said well it's actually very straightforward what we make is we make rick's games with john blanche's artwork and alan merritt's miniatures because alan was in charge of miniatures design so of course the designs were done by jez and the perrys and and trish and ali and and brian nelson and and that team of people but the person who was kind of looking at and managing the miniature designers was alan merrick and he'd been with games workshop since 1980 mm -hmm. you know early days of citadel he was one of the first ever employees at citadel and there's nothing that alan doesn't know about toy soldiers uh, from both a kind of manufacturer casting design character level he'd learned it all from brian and from his own insights so that was it so we made rick's games with alan's miniatures and john's artwork and that's what we put together and so i i from my point of view i go you guys know exactly what you're doing what you want my job is to make sure that happens uh on a day-to-day -day basis with all of the detail managed and that we get a white dwarf out and that we get these products out on time I'm going to let you ask another question because I will keep, <laughs> I will um, keep, chance, I will keep chancering in the same fashion. <laughs> well, everyone's here to listen to you rather than me anyway. And you've covered a lot of the things that I've got bullet pointed to ask you. But if we go back and kind of delve into things a, a little bit more, go, go, go. thinking back to your sort of editorial time at, at White Dwarf, you mentioned Brian's input. Um, yeah. were, were you given a, a brief um, of of how the magazine should be or, or maybe even change and then were there things that you did during your time as editor that you wanted to slightly change the, the, the way the magazine was presented or, or, or have a different end result with it as it's opposed a, it, to the it, previous editions it's a really good question and, and actually i went back and I, i've thought about this recently and i'm just going to have a look have a look at some notes because there is a note things have a momentum and so when i stepped into or strapped myself into the white wolf editor's chair there were a number of issues where nothing changed and i think if if i go back and i look at this one um white wolf at the time i would think you know it was slightly dull and worthy the contents page looks like mm -hmm. a academic journal yeah slightly it's slightly kind of worthy with the photographs it was it was also um this magazine and you know you people will be familiar with this it's it's not full color it's what was yeah. called four, black, four back one. And I think it was about, and I'm just looking at a note here that I wrote. I think it was White Wolf 150. So mm -hmm. I took over 140 and at white by 150. So that's kind of 10 months, nine, 10 months later, I knew what I was doing. Because, you know, we all suffer from imposter syndrome. I'd never, never edited a magazine before. I'd never had responsibility for getting this out on a monthly basis. I was making it up as I was going along. I had experience, I had life experience, and I had some publishing experience. But, you know, all of us, in all our jobs, 
most of us anyway, hopefully not doctors and dentists and uh, <laughs> airline pilots, are winging it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the case. And yeah. so by 150, I went, okay, this is my magazine now. And I know what I want to do with it. And I know where I want to go with it. And so I changed the contents page and made it kind of full color, visual, big white dwarf logo, simplified it and started to work with the way things looked and the way things were laid out. The big change, the big thing that I was so excited about was battle reports. Mm -hmm. Because the battle report that I wrote in 1988 that was published in 1989 as, I think it was 88, as um, 24 hours at Carrick Mound. And this was the battle report that was based on my um, game with the kids at the youth club. I published it in White Dwarf and, and I wanted that in White Dwarf because I had a vision for battle reports. And, and I, I, again, I talk about this in the book. I might have mentioned this before somewhere else. But when in my late 70s, period, I was a huge fan of a hex board game called Squad Leader. And Squad Leader was produced by Avalon Hill. It was World War II Russian Front combat game that involved basically i mean small cardboard counters but each counter was either a squad of infantry or an individual character leader with individual tanks and vehicles and anti-tank guns so it was small scale it was basically a miniatures game without um miniatures in it but in fact andy chambers and i later on we converted the squad leader rules to a miniatures game and we used to play uh world war ii micro armor games using this hex based system okay because it's just such a beautiful system and and there's something there that flows back later so andy and i used to get together every thursday and play toy soldier games around at my house we play squad leader but with miniatures and micro armor in the jet that's the story in avalon hill had a magazine called the general right and general was a bit like their white dwarf it was to promote their hobby and the collect, collect war gaming and in the in the general they had a feature called after action reports Mm -hmm. And in after action reports, they would get the games designers, often John Hill or, and one of the other big guys, John Hill Design Squad Leader. And they get them and they say, OK, you're going to play this scenario. Tell us about your force selection. Tell us about what your plans are. And then they go through a blow by blow of the game, dice rolls. Ah, oh, you rolled a six at that point, la, 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 la. And then at the end of the game, they would uh, do a kind of sum of, well, that didn't go well for me, did it? Or that was shit. And when I went, when that pack, that pack shot penetrated the Sherman, that was the end of the game because we lost that kind of stuff. And I went, that's it. That's what I want to do in White Dwarf, but I want to do that for Warhammer and 40K. And I had this picture in my head about how this would should, should work. 24 hours in Carrick Mound, wasn't it? And there was another couple of battle reports. But finally, I got, I think it might have been Andy and Jervis, and I'm just going to check again. It was, yeah, it was um, Andy and Jervis, and it was issue 143. So three issues after I'd taken control, we had the Light Up Craft World versus the Blood Angels. I and it was it well. space, Marine, space Marine battle report. Yep. And it was, you know, we didn't do a 40K battle report. For, for, people go, oh, there were loads of 40K battle reports between Jack, Andy and Jervis. No, was, these were Space Marine. But we got a battle report and we got exactly, we had the games designer, in this case, you know, Jervis and Andy, Jervis had designed Titan Legions and Space Marine with Andy Chambers, who was just a passionate gamer about Space Marine system playing this game. And we, they recorded it and they photographed it and we put it together and we put it out as a battle report. And it was just such an amazing buzz to see that. And it just created this kind of buzz out there, not just among, among readers like you that you remember it, but in the Games Workshop community. And again, I'm, I think back about this and think, what were we doing there? We didn't know quite what we were doing there because you never do you're making it up as you go along don't forget this there's no master plan and yeah. one, of, <laughs> one of the things that i loved about the book we produced talking miniatures is there's no master plan what you what we get is talking to people who are doing stuff on a daily basis and just making it up as they went along anyway we did that remember this is a world there is no youtube there is no internet the internet no. doesn't ex doesn't exist the only way you got of communicating with people who are passionate about the hobby is through a magazine it's through yep. white Dwarf. and what i wanted to do in white Dwarf is what people do on youtube now is i want to show brilliantly painted miniatures on fabulous terrain with people talking in their natural voices about the game and what they're trying Absolutely. to do Shit. she is rolled a fistful of sixes oh god i've gone down blah, blah, blah. explosions north kaboom i i wanted that movie to run in people's heads oh, even pretty... though 
even though we didn't know that's what we were doing, but we kind of did. It's really um, interesting to hear you talk about it in that way. So I've got a few notes about that. And one thing, it was the first thing I turned to as a early teen um, was always the battle reports and the kind of the rivalry, the, the fun rivalry of the built up between some of the studio members and how often Jervis didn't win a game and all that kind of stuff. But, but also the connection you've made there to, to, to YouTube. And I suppose Games Workshop up until recently would still have some of their designers and things making videos or being out there with the public. It's not quite so much a thing anymore. They're not at games days, but the magazine for me as someone who didn't live in a town with a games workshop was my connection to, to you guys. And those little black and white pictures later to become color of the studio members of the studio and the magazine team. I felt I got to know you all as personalities yeah. through those pages. And now the internet takes the place of that it without does. GW, but, uh, but it's, I, I wonder whether we'd have this YouTube battle report scene that we have these days if you didn't do battle reports the way you did in, in, in White Dwarf in that era. I well, definitely I, think I, there's a growth. It, it's, it's quite, it, it is quite amazing. And it's amazing to me. I mean, generally amazing to me. I mean, I kind of, because I talked to you about the general and I had this picture in my head of what we should be doing here and how we could do it and how cool. I I mean, this is way before I worked for Games Workshop in the, you know, I was in the 70s. I was reading the squad leader uh, battle accounts and they were just thrilling about how other guys played the game and what I was missing in the way I played the game it was just so exciting and so that's what we set out to do and actually uh, quite quickly and again I'm just going to have a quick look at I, I did write a note on this is that actually we did we did a battle report the first one in White Dwarf was 107 and that was 24 hours in Carrick Mound in 123 there was another Warhammer battle report called Clash of Evil a guy called mm -hmm. Peter Morrison sent that in and then we did three issues after I became editor. We did the first, what I call the mo first modern battle report, which is Light Up Craft World. And then there was nothing. And then 40, 148, we did Nigel Stillman and Andy Chambers, Battle of Blood Keep. That was the first mm -hmm. war one. And then pretty much after that, from 153 onwards, which is less than, that's 10 issues, less than a year after I took over, the, about a year after I took the magazine, it became the monthly feature. It mm -hmm. became so important to the company and to the customers and to the staff that that became the regular go-to feature. And I think it would it would be a strange issue. Only something like Golden Demon, where mm -hmm. we had to fill pages would, with, with beautiful model soldiers, would actually disrupt a battle report because they were so, mm -hmm. such a big deal. But again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say to you, um, you can't imagine, I can barely imagine, what it was like producing those battle reports in those uh, years because again we're, we're barely digital mm. we're barely digital so imagine andy and jervis up on the top floor of uh, uh, the, the upper the, the mezzanine of uh, castle boulevard and they're playing a game and you and i have played lots of war games and everyone plays war games and everyone knows it's like play war games you're rolling dice and you're drinking beer or tea and, and chatting and going away so they're not they're playing a game but they're, they've got a notepad and they're recording dice rolls and making notes as they go along. They've got, get this, a Polaroid camera <laughs> that you go click and zzz, a little self-developing Polaroid comes out and they're taking Polaroids, no digital photography, no iPhone photography, none of that shit. Um, Polaroids and then they're writing on the Polaroid, you know, turn one, the charge of the whatever putting that to one side with the notes this isn't a war game this would take them a day yeah i can imagine <laughs> to play the game with all of these interruptions and people wandering up go oh what are you doing oh it looks great oh, it looks great and J andy says the reason jervis lost all the time is jervis is a much better gamer than me he's much sharper he has an amazing understanding of probability and statistics he said I could just cope with all the crap that we had to do. <laughs> Jervis just kind of got lost his train of thought because I had to write notes and keep track of dice rolls and all of that. So these people kind of looked at those games and it's beautiful. It's beautiful in the same way that YouTube uh, videos are beautiful. People saw them just as kind of game reports, just like the games you would play with your mate and with other, other, other people. But they weren't. They were publishing activities. They were yep. all about publishing and 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 there's something else i'll say about that so that that's what happened also imagine those maps mm. those maps we, we'd get somebody to hand draw a map 
and then we'd stick that on a photocopier remember photocopiers and photocopy a dozen copies of it of the battle map and then we would have little sticky symbols and we'd move the sticky symbols around and then photocopy <laughs> it. I mean, it, it just sounds absurd now. But if you look at a light up craft world, that's how it was done. And the trees and things like that were actually letter set, rub down letter set. Really? Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, we, I remember we, that stuff. Remember rub down letter set when you were too, yeah. <laughs> you know, that rub down. I mean, again, that's, that's, that's another world. The thing I was going to say was something about, uh, it was interesting talking to Mike McVeigh about um when i said that this is a publishing activity not a gaming mm -hmm. activity it's designed for a purpose is to actually demonstrate how the game's being played and, and all of that the thing about the you know those mid 90s miniatures people go about oh they're so bright and you go you go along now and you see them in the warhammer world uh, the fabulous museum there they've got at games workshop at warhammer world and you go shit those are bright colors and the reason the colors so bright is that mike mcveigh in particular really understood that if you put a miniature on a um on a table and you're going to photograph it and and again in these days of iphones people aren't going to believe this but we had a photographic studio with big white overhead lights big flashlights connected to a analog camera that shot onto film it shot five by four plate film you almost had bellows like a victorian <laughs> photographer and that you'd line up your shot and guess what your shot would be upside down because there was no correcting mirror in the camera. <laughs> so you look at this upside down <laughs> and you would flash them with this amazing simple flash white light and it would bleach all the color out. So if yeah. you painted them in a normal tone, they would just look flat and awful. And if you boosted up the colors, then when the light bleached those colors down, they would look kind of almost Better. normal normal miniatures and that's why they look they are now to our eye those mid-90s people go god they loved red god they loved yellow and it makes but a lot of sense it was because they're being painted for a purpose and the purpose mm -hmm. was that they've got to appear in white dwarf looking great they've got to appear on a box front looking great and they've got to appear in a codex or an army book looking great and so they dial it dial it up to 11 and then when the lights flashed it will drop to an eight and they'll yeah. still look vibrant but it, it, all of these things were done through a per for a purpose and they're all done by trial and error absolutely and, absolutely and again when we're taking those photographs you know i mean people won't understand this now in the days of photoshop but you'd have to bracket the shot You'd look at the you'd look at the Polaroid that Andy and Jervis had taken, and then you get the heavy metal miniatures, and you try and recreate that on a piece of tabletop, and then you get the shot lined up, and you take the shot, and then you'd open the shutter one stop, so you'd let a bit more light in and overexpose, and then you'd shut it down and you'd underexpose, and it's called bracketing the shot. Right. So you get the exposure right on, and just in case you screw up, you let a bit more light in and a little less light in. And then those three five by fours would go off to a photo developer. And then a few days later, we'd get these color transparencies back that we'd then have to use yeah. to lay out the article. And there's no there's no adjusting them in Photoshop. Yeah. Ultra, uh, none of that existed. Didn't exist. Didn't exist. Not, not a thing of it. We just... <laughs> it's it was it was banging rocks together i'm telling you <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you you talk about mike mcveigh there so this is a slight sort of change in tap but out of all those issues and i got all the issues out last night that, that you were edif editor of i was trying to work out whether i had a favorite article or issue and i was drawn to 140 and and mike mcveigh's wood elf army and he did a yes. large article about how he painted it. And I spent a lot of time looking at that and planning how my Wood Elf army, which never really materialized properly at the time, was going to look like that. And I, I just, as a probably a 12 year old, then maybe 13, it had such an impact on me looking at those pages. Um, I just wondered if you had a favorite issue from the time or article from the time you oh, were editing. That's really difficult. That's really, really difficult. Um, I it's kind of weird weird I, I guess it's weird to say there are things that i really enjoyed that i was personally involved in okay mm -hmm. so the things that i was personally involved in i I'm, I'm i'm a big scenic head i love war games terrain and making war games terrain and mm -hmm. so i was very passionate about um uh, terrain building articles in there and yeah. if, if you remember around that time 
I think Rick and I co-authored this series. People were kind of saying, oh, terrain is really difficult. And I was going out and I was seeing people playing war games in the shops and elsewhere on really shitty terrain and saying it's really difficult to make terrain. This is before Games Workshop made any kind of uh, range of terrain. Didn't do it. It's too expensive. That's another story about how ferociously expensive plastic injection molding is um, compared to uh, metal, metal in rubber, which is toy soldiers. But I said to Rick, look, I can make a house with a cornflake packet, a pair of scissors and some PVA glue. <laughs> anyway, go on then. And so we did. And I went, that's the brief. So the brief was make some really cool looking terrain with a cornflake packet. That's all the cardboard you've got. No scalpels, knives, special cutting tools, a pair of scissors and some PVA glue. And, and we did at least one or two. I'm really fond of that. I went back and saw them. And was, that was such a really cool idea. And it makes a really nice little Warhammer house. And of course, I bashed it together. I kit bashed it effectively. And then sadly for the article, I think we gave it to Dave Andrews. Say, Dave Andrews, make a nice one of those. But you only get a cornflake pack here. <laughs> For the cardboard, I'm very fond of those. And then a couple of weeks ago, uh, you might be aware, there's a um, Brian and Diane Ansell. They still run an event called uh, Boil, Bring Out Your Lead, which is kind of the, the old Warhammer groups go to long to boil. I hope to make uh, one one day. And I went to the most recent one. It was only a couple of weeks ago on Saturday. And it's lovely. It's, it's, it's fantastic wargaming get together because they don't charge any admission and there's no traders. There's no selling. It's just people who love old warhammer miniatures going on. and i walked into this um in, into this room and i looked to my right and there was a table an epic table with titans and space marines and there were those um 40k bunkers made out of a 20 mil hawk cavalry base with some sides and uh minefields and barbed wire coil barbed wire because andy and i did an article in white dwarf about minefields barbed wire and fortifications in yes. space marine in epic and i just looked at this and said shit how come 30 years ago an article that i wrote in white dwarf and here's this guy and I, the guy looked at me and i looked at him and i went and i said look i have to say it's 30 years ago it's just brilliant looking this tabletop and it, oh one side of it was festooned with minefields and barbed wire. And he said, yeah, he said, yeah, look, I've got your article here. And he got out the white dwarf. Amazing. Oh. With, with that particular article that I'd done in it. It was just a like, we had a great chat. And he said, you know the thing you never put in there? He said, you never put how you destroy the barbed wire. <laughs> or can you destroy it? I said, well, yeah, you run a land raider over it. Or a rhino, you've got to remove it. Or, you know, you roll a dice. On a six, it stays in place. One, two, three, or five, it's gone. It was that kind of make it up kind of war game conversation. And that was just a joy. And so I, I've got a fondness for those. There's also another, there's a, I had, um when third edition, was it third? No, fourth edition, one, two, three, third edition Blood Bowl came out. And third edition Blood Bowl for me was one of the pinnacles of Jervis's game design. It was the, and he says himself, it's the first time he thinks he got everything right. And actually, it was just fantastic that that came out. And I wrote really nice. I, know I had um, a human team called, they were originally called the Death Heads, but they transformed into the Love Pirates of Doom, which was, <laughs> <laughs> which was my name for my Blood Bowl team. And I wrote an article in, in White Dwarf that was kind of had a lot of him called Block and Tackle which was mm -hmm. uh, a kind of tongue-in-cheek joke. But I, I'm really fond of that article. And that article regularly appears on various forums and stuff. And it was just a nice piece of writing illustrated about tactics in Blood Bowl for human teams. And so I've got these kind of fondness things. Um, anything, other other bits in White Dwarf? Uh, the battle reports, kind of all of them, you know, as part of writing the book, I went back and I looked at, and I remembered every single one. I remember every single one, not by name, but as soon as I started flicking, whether it was Bill King and, and Nigel Stillman playing or they were all great. They were they were, they were, they were they were all great. They were our YouTube, as we as we've said. So Yeah, that makes sense. So I want to go on and talk about talking miniatures and give you a chance to sort of explain to more people about this book that you've been working on with John Stella. But before we do, I've got one more sort of question for you. Go, go, go. What was your, if you got one overriding favourite memory when, while you worked at Games Workshop, anything that really stands out? Oh, uh, there are too many to say one. And one that just popped into my head 
uh, which just because it was so ridiculous, is I you know I, I I'm I'm a bit of a gobshite. I can talk for, I can talk for England, and and often at games days we would uh, I would I would kind of MC bits of games day. And it was the year that Gorka Morka came out, which must have been 96 mm -hmm. or 97. And we've been growing bad. into the games days at um, in Birmingham, National Indoor Arena and uh, the the NEC. And I think we we're at the National National Indoor Arena. And Gorka Morka had come out and I somehow got on stage and I'm standing there, there's this big wall of people at, kind of I banked in front of me and I said right everybody on that side you're Gorka and all the other side of people on that side you're Morka and you're at war with each other and so let's start the chant and I had kind of the NEC kind of once I go Gorka Morka Gorka Morka it was just, it was just amazing I was just funny it, I, there's no film of that there's no video of that people there will remember it it's like you know 10,000 people chanting Gorka and Morka in, in synchronous you got your rock star moment <laughs> that was just that was just crazy um other other moments were kind of there were moments that were terrifying uh what was a terrifying moment terrifying moment was before again if you're around in the 90s you'll remember we finally got a system that worked at games days for the golden demon awards and yep. for the golden demon awards people would bring along their miniatures they would put them on the stands we would get a ticket that we would tear in half one would be would they'd be individually numbered they'd stand their miniature on one half they would take the other half as their, as their receipt which meant that the judges had no idea who it was just a number on a piece of miniature on space it was great for the judges so there's no names there's no connection and then we'd have a team of magic fairies that would collect all of these numbers and put them in those card index boxes in in number number order and of course on that they would have the name and address of the person before we got that system and that system was very robust and it went around the world and it was just a piece of brilliant before then the stores would collect at the golden demon winning entries and they would um, bring them to the studio so that we could photograph them. Right. And first, they'd, they'd be gathered up by the store managers, regional managers, get them from the store, bring them there, but Eastwood, bring them to the studio. They got them to the studio. So I was, we were waiting for these, so we could start photographing the Golden Demon entries. And this must have been about, I don't know, 94, 95, was I, I think I was studio manager. I might have been White Dwarf editor, so it might have been late 90s. So I got these case of miniatures, the Golden Demon winning miniatures, and I opened up this case, and it was full of broken bits. <laughs> <laughs> broken bits i went what's going on here sorry and, you know that bits wings broken off a war eagle and so i phoned at eastwood and said what's going on with these miniatures and they're going oh I don't know. they were fine when they left here and we're going well they're not fine now and eventually we tracked this back to the taxi driver who shuttled them from eastwood and he said as i got out the taxi the case came open and they all dropped on the floor and he said i didn't know what i said i just put them back in the case and we were going oh shit what are we going to do here so and then we got a load of guys to go out where the taxi parked and there were more bits of miniatures in the gutter no. and, of the crap. and so we got them in and we, I got the heavy metal team. I said, right, that's the material. I want those looking pristine <laughs> within an hour. And so the heavy metal team, I said, they did a fabulous job. And they got all these broken bits of these miniatures that people had spent weeks and months painting. Mm -hmm. And they assembled them and they put them back together with green stuff and, and glue and repainted them. And we presented them as the Golden Demon winning entries for that year. I don't think anybody ever knew about it. I think we wow. got it. I think we got away with the whole thing, but that was one of those moments of what a crazy oh, story. Oh shit, terror! When you just <laughs> got to fix something because you go, okay, don't worry, don't blame, just fix it right yeah. now, sort wow. it out. So there's some that, painters that didn't when they got their miniatures back went <laughs> slightly, <laughs> slightly that, different. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember my blending technique being that good. <laughs> oh, that looks like Mike Bovey. <laughs> Oh, possibly story. but that but that was also i mean it was also great um because what we would do back in back in those days is everybody who won uh, a trophy at golden demon we would invite them up again after that happened we went we're not going to do that again we're not going to handle people's personal miniatures what we'll say is you come to the studio for a day and we'd invite all the trophy winners up they'd come 
we'd give them a studio tour, we'd uh, show them around what we were doing. You know, we were just much more relaxed and there was no kind of secrecy about the product schedules. Everyone knew what we were doing. And they would then go over to Eastwood and they would be given a box and they would be given half an hour on the miniatures racks to fill, <laughs> to select whatever they wanted and just fill their box with, with bits of metal, with, with lead. And there was one guy, he was great. He used to come up, uh, he kept, I don't think he ever won a, won a sword but he was obviously, obviously a category winner. And he came up with his young son. He was saying to me, he said, we plan our next year's model before we get here so that we know exactly what we're going to go to. In the racks. <laughs> Brilliant. So you can get all these extra wheels and bits and arms and heads and stuff and all this stuff you can't normally get on your hands on without spending a fortune. And he would do that. And, and that was great. I, I mean, there's lots, lots and lots of very fun, nice memories. And then, the, you know, the, you know, White Dwarf, when White Dwarf had to come, we used to pass on press in White Dwarf. And so passing on press means we would go down to the printers, Artisan in Leicester, and it would mean, mean a 12-hour shift on the sofa while they were printing sections. And then you'd have to go down and you look with the glass and, and it was just, I mean, lots of stuff. Again, pre-analog day, pre-digital days. Uh, I, you can't imagine what the world was like. So lots of fun. There's battle reports. I'm still very proud of because I see battle reports as my invention, not my invention, but my innovation mm -hmm. of seeing in some ways that digital future of YouTube and all the rest of it. And how do we do that? How do we do that in a way that lets people peer into the studio and engage with Andy and Jervis and Rick and Nigel Stillman and Bill King and all of these people that are such kind of kind of I don't, I don't i don't like the heroes or role models because i don't see myself as anything like that i was just a guy that was in lucky to be in the right place at the right time and i just did the best job i could that's it no more no less no bollocks that's that's just what it is i did the best job i could for, at the time and that's what all of the people and again coming back to the book we know um, shortly after we started working, the, I mean, the Talking Miniatures came around just because John and I were sitting in his back garden in the autumn of 2016. That's that's a long time ago, almost seven years ago, saying, uh, we're getting old men now. Somebody should write some of this shit down before we all become <laughs> too decrepit to forget it. Otherwise, people won't believe it. And we kicked this around. And then John and I just looked at each other and said, look, you know, why don't we do it? We can do this. We, we know the people involved. And so we had this idea that somehow we would create, write a story of, of the early years of Games Workshop and Citadel Miniature. And we didn't know what to do because we are not historians. You know, I'm not a historian. John's not a historian. We're storytellers. And so we we went and we said, OK, let's go and we'll go and talk to Rick. And, and I've told the story a couple of times before. I've got, a, you know, I, I play guitar and I've got a little digital recorder because I, I like recording music. And I took my digital recorder, ran to Rick's house and we put it on the table. We got some tea and biscuits out and we talked to him. Rick, tell us how you came to work for Games Workshop there. And out of that conversation flowed these most wonderful amazing stories recollections and lots of the people that are in the book whether it's rick or jervis or andy chambers or trish or bob naismith or tony ackland you know they've been interviewed various things on you know realms of chaos there's lots of web um, websites out there but when they're interviewed as i say that people are slightly deferential you know they're kind of dear mr Priestley, tell us your wisdom sir <laughs> but rick is rick you know rick, rick is the same irascible character he's always been and what we got was not a slightly deferential interview. We got three old mates sitting together, reminiscing about what it was like. And a story from one of us would spark a recollection from another, which would spark a memory from somebody else. And often we would fall on the floor laughing because we, we would nobody would believe this shit. But that's but that's what it was. And when I listened back to the tapes, I said, John, we've just got it. We've got something I've never heard before. And if we can capture that over and over again, then we've got a book of recollections. Mm -hmm of the early days of Citadel and Games Workshop, not from that kind of, you know, I'm, I'm taking nothing from Stephen Ian. Stephen Ian were the founders, and without their enter enterprise and their passion and commitment, none of this would exist. But mm -hmm. actually, I didn't want that top-down view of the senior management or the strategic thinkers. I wanted the people doing stuff, like me, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's a different work. story. It's a different story. It's people doing stuff. In the back of the book, I wrote a line that said, this is the story of ordinary people doing extraordinary things with an incredible level of passion, and commitment and belief. And that's what it is. You know, none of these people, these are all incredibly humble people. 
whether it's Trish or Bob or Jervis or Andy or Rick himself, you know, these are not these are not superstars. These are not big I am's. They're incredibly humble people who just were doing the best they could with mm-hmm. at that time and consider themselves grateful and fortunate that the opportunity they found themselves in an opportunity and an environment. You know, I, I consider myself in that. What a, what a gift to be at that age, surrounded by some of the most talented, creative people in the gaming industry. And how lucky yeah. was I to get there at that point? And um, yes, absolutely. And, and, and that's it. That's it. That's so what, it. What was your What was your process for for doing the book then? So obviously, you mentioned you recorded the interview with with, with Rick. Was that how we, you sort of set out to do it all? We we started with Rick, and we listened back to the tapes. And went, oh, that was great. That was great. And so let's go and talk to somebody else. So I think we then went and talked. So I can't remember who the second was. We talked to um, Paul Robbins, who mm-hmm. lots of people might not know. Paul won two successive Golden Dame, Golden Demon Slayer swords. I think ninety and ninety one. He won the sword twice. It was the first time everyone had won it back to back twice. And he was in the RAF at the time. And then he left the RAF and he came to join Games Workshop. And he was the Citadel factory manager at Eastwood in right. that, that latter part period. You know, he was he was a he was a RAF engineer, ground crew engineer, and he was used to kind of structuring people. He tells some great stories. So we interviewed Paul and then Richard Ellard again, who's uh, for many people isn't an obvious name, but Richard joined the studio from Skytrex in the mm-hmm. early 80s and was studio manager throughout the Warhammer 2 and Bloodbath of Orcs Drift and all of that up to 40k and then shortly after 40k he went to the US where he still lives to found Games Workshop America and really push forward the developments of Games Workshop in America and Richard's just got some fantastic insights because he spans kind of management and creativity um, and then we talked to Richard and we did the same thing we just taped it and then <laughs> then we had a ridiculous conversation with Alan and Michael Perry um, in Alan's house, there was just these two guys, you know, just they're just they finish each other's sentences. You know, they're twins. They talk at the same time. And by this point, we've got a lovely woman called Helen Morley, who also appears in the book, who was living in Ireland. And she was taking the tapes and she was transcribing them. And so she was transcribing and then sending me the word documents back. And, you know, I got a phone call from Helen. She says, I have no idea who's talking here. I can't tell. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> And so I said, don't worry, Helen, I'll just figure it out later by listening back to the tapes and just just send me the transcript. So we got these transcripts back from Helen. And then I would start editing because obviously a conversation you've recorded, as you well know, on a podcast or on a recorder isn't broadcastable normally in its raw form because, you know, there's ums and ahs and there's a bit we can't include that bit. And let's that be that all. And so I would then edit. So I would edit the, the text for language and content and style and consistency, take out repetition and clean that up. And then I'd go looking for images. And so I'd go looking for images through my own collection of products and other people's collection of products and start to put this together. Um, Because again, one of the weird things about from now, from a 2023 perspective, is there are so few images of the early games workshop in Sistol. Why is that? Well, it's because the only cameras you had were little point and click instamatics that you took on holiday with you and you bought one and you took it on holiday and you shot 24 frames and you gave it to the chemist yes. boots <laughs> and then they'd send you holiday snaps back 24 yeah. of them and nobody would take a camera into work and photograph apart from trish who did some of this and so trish had some has a small collection but no more than top 20 images yeah. of Perry's and Jairs and various people in the studio. There are no images. There, not, there are, you know, there's the classic one of Brian Ansel in his brown coat in front of the miniature racks that we've all seen dozens of times. Why is that? Because no, nobody had a mobile phone with a camera. It was ridiculous. Ridiculous <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, so we had to go, how are we going to illustrate this? And eventually we went back to the products themselves and said, okay, when Jervis is talking about this or Paul Sawyer is talking about this issue of White Dwarf, let's put that issue of White Dwarf. And that will actually trigger a certain nostalgia in people. Yes. And, and, and Richard Hale, the lovely man who runs Stuff of Legends website mm-hmm. yeah. uh, over in America, Richard gave us access to his collection of miniatures and said, yeah, you can use any one of those. Just credit Stuff of Legends and me and, and I'll send you the high res. And so we we just we wanted a picture book. Because you know, then what we've got here. Says reaching over his shoulder um, is two volumes of books talking miniatures. 
and it's full of pictures it's full of pictures of Brilliant. old toy soldiers it's a picture book it's not a literal history it's um that's what it is and that's how it came about so how did that all happen same way as everything else Stuart we made it up as we went along <laughs> John and I didn't have a plan back in the day we just said we can do a book we know the people let's start talking to people and see where we get to and yeah. and and it floundered around for a couple of years and then covid happened and so a lot of the conversations then moved to zoom like everyone else's conversations at the time so mike mcveigh was up in the lake district and we talked to mike on zoom trish we talked on zoom andy chambers we talked on zoom because we couldn't do face-to-face -face conversations anymore but they were great and we we had the conversation again we'd send the tapes to helen helen would transcribe they'd come back to me and then we saw source images people were very generous with their personal collections of images you know personal products or miniatures or stuff from their collection you know, we've got mike mcveigh's rejection letter from john blanche his wow. book, <laughs> which he still had because mike was about 18 i think he was barely 18 and he came to the studio for an interview and he went to see john blanche and on jump over on the shelf behind john was that classic john blanche mona lisa minotaur figure yeah. as mike describes it he was sitting there going Oh, <laughs> and John Blanche was thought this kid's a bit of a nutter can clearly paint miniatures but yeah a bit too weird for us and so and Mike still had his rejection letter which was lovely and he gave us that and we printed that in the book and so lots and lots of kind of artifacts and and uh Bob Naismith had uh I don't even think I can get to them uh there's somewhere he had lots of biro sketches can I find yeah look at these these are biro sketches by Bob Mason. Oh, wow. You can even see the lines on the paper because it's just a notepad with lots of, bi lots of biro sketches of early Fantastic. space. Things. You know, it, we've got hold of stuff like that. People have been hugely generous with us mm -hmm. um, in terms of their personal collections and miniatures and, and artifacts from the early days. But very few photographs, very few photographs. Right. So, so it, it was just a matter of, we're all getting older. And we've lost people. We've already mm. lost people. You know, we lost Wayne England. We lost Mike Brunton. And we lost, we're losing people of, the, if you like, our generation. And somehow we just felt this is important enough to be captured. And one of the things I, for reasons that we don't understand, I certainly don't understand, in the UK and maybe globally, but certainly in the UK, for the last 100 years, there's been a major toy soldier company. From about 1890 through to about 1940-50, it was Britain's. You know, mm -hmm. Britons yep, and their met metal soldiers initially, and then they got into plastic injection molding. And then Airfix was the dominant force in the 60s through to late 60s, early 70s. The thing about Airfix is they never cracked what to do with the toy soldiers. They never cracked that combination of toy soldiers and rules. Mm -hmm. They just didn't get it because that rules thing was part of the historical wargaming thing. And so kids like me, well, you know, you'd build a Spitfire and you'd hang it on string and then set fire to it or put a banger in your tiger tank at November the 5th from Black <laughs> <laughs> and destroy these things. Maybe you bought more, but you destroy them. But it was Brian or Brian or Rick or some combination of that that went, if you join these two things together, brilliant game rules with yeah. fabulous miniatures you've got something sustaining and that was the gift of games workshop and that's why citadel games workshop has been the dominant force for the last 30 40, i don't know how many years and he's set to be so for the foreseeable future yeah it, it's that combination and that combination had um we understood that very clearly way back in the day because we used to tier miniature releases on three tiers and we'd say look what we have here the lowest tier if you like rank three is a remake of an old miniature so you've got a, a codex or army book and you've got a miniature in it and the miniature is just a bit shit because it was it was not very good and we just made a remake so it's remaking an old thing a new version of an older thing with existing rules tier three tier two was actually making miniature that was in the codex or army book but for which there was no model in the range because often yeah. when the we wrote the codex as an army is the designers would be imagining models that simply didn't exist we didn't get around to it and um, so people would have to do make do's or conversions or do their own versions for that miniature that was tier two because that was kind of exciting because so there's a miniature for a hole in the range but tier one 
these were new miniatures with new rules because they would bend the tabletop. They would bend the tabletop dynamic and make the game different and exciting and, and newly challenging. And they were the tier one releases. And that's why, you know, new codex, new army books, new versions of 40K or Warhammer were always so exciting because they were tier one. They were new models with new rules and a new tabletop dynamic for players to go at and learn about. I could... <laughs> yeah, I, I I can listen. I can listen and listen. So I'm oh. super excited about my copy turning up, which hopefully could be could be very very soon. I, I noticed on Facebook you were you were John were very busy signing away all of the. We've the, been the signing copies. away. Yeah, we we've, we've been we had a sign rate of about fifty books an hour. <laughs> oh. We have two volumes, and we have getting an outward slipcase signing them both signing them then put them back in the slip it was a pro it's a process and it's still ongoing but we're getting there um so yeah yeah all of, so, all, all, of, all of that so tell tell everyone where they can get the book then um well, rather than it. me you've got uh, well at the moment you can get the book we were on pre-sale there's a, there's a website called talkingminiatures.co.uk that we set up as a sales portal and um, because it's john and i uh we undenied about um do we get a publisher for this and we had some conversations with publishers but we went look john publishes games and books and miniatures Warlord, that's what warlord does for a living and it distributes yeah. them globally why are we being stupid so we set up a company called shaggy dog publishing because we tell shaggy dog stories uh, and so shaggy dog publishing is a tiny little company that has two staff john and i and i suppose if we're being poncy about it we say two directors john and i but there's just two staff and we set up Shaggy Dog Publishing to get Talking Miniatures out the door. And so that's Shaggy Dog Publishing has published Talking Miniatures, but all of the logistics and distribution has been handled by Warlord Games. So you go via either talkingminiatures.co.uk, there's a sales portal there. You click, that will take you straight through to Warlord Games, and they will dispatch into Europe, UK, or rest of the world. And that's where you buy the book. Um, it's on. It's off, no longer on pre-sale, because when it was on pre-sale, John and I promised as you said, that we would hand sign <laughs> every single copy. And we have done so. We've hand signed every single pre-ordered copy. Um, after midnight on last Sunday, it went off pre-sale. So no further copies will be signed. Apart from on the 2nd of September, we're going to be at the Warlord Open Day. And so if people can make it along to Nottingham for the Warlord Open Day, which is a great event anyway. You get factory tours and studio tours and you get special miniatures and all sorts of grooviness if you're interested in bolt action and historical war games and who isn't. Um, I think very few people maybe die hard. I'm seeing blood red skies on you over your shoulders. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I will be going on yes. uh, onto the open but, day. So, so yeah. we're, we're hoping that we'll get some friends along as well and we'll do some extra signings. So Jervis and Andy's around and Trish is coming down. And so people who've got a book without uh, can get extra some extra signatures on there just as a freebie. So that's going to be on 2nd of September. After that, we expect it will be out on Amazon because Amazon is, I mean, sadly, you know, we all understand what Amazon is and what Amazon does, but it's one of the ways that one of the ways of getting your book distributed globally through yeah, Amazon. Yeah, understandable. Um, Very understandable. If somebody, if, if some bookseller like Waterstones or whatever came to us and said, we love your book, we want to stock it, then we'd, we'd, we'd say yes, but that's a whole different game. We didn't want to get into that book publishing game. We're, it, we understand this is a niche offer yes yep. the small niche of people which you're included in who love that era of games workshop and sizzle measures as john and i do because this has been our own labor of love to produce and create this book it's the book i wanted to read about games workshop and Citadel, so i wrote it um or put or, or help put it together um and we know that's not for everybody in the same way that the games workshop hobby is not for everybody and the toy soldier hobby is not for everybody there's only a small percentage of the population that want to paint miniatures by hand collect them line them up read complex sets of rules and then fight battles with them it's we, we have to respect that it's a niche activity but that's fine we're not interested in, in being evangelists we just want to make people happy and i'm i'm deadly serious here my job will if people get this book and have a really good time with it and love some of the stories and love some of the insights because you know the stuff in there that i didn't know and i've, I've mentioned it a couple of times to a couple of people about how when we talked to bob Naismith, he explained how the space marine backpack the nested pack came from the world war one doughboy backpack the world war one okay. american gi backpack has three nested pockets on the back yeah so that and the bedroll that was bent over the top, he said they'll just put vents on the bedroll to make the breathing <laughs> apparatus. And, and it, we went, 
Bob, I've never heard that story before. And the book is full of those kind of stories that we've never heard before. So certainly people outside of Games Workshop would never heard before. And it's been told by the people who were there doing it. So that's that's the book. And that's why we think it's great. And we think that hobbyists will enjoy it. If people enjoy it, then that's great. If we make some money, that would be great too. But that's not why we've done it. Yeah. We've, done, we, we've not done this to make money. I mean, John's runs his own business and he's comfortable. I, I had 24 years at Games Workshop. I had a very nice life there and I ended up with a very nice pension from them. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in a comfortable place in my life. I don't, we don't need, we don't need them. If we make some money, you know, we'll think of something else to do. Now, what yeah. other books? Do? What, other cool stuff, what <laughs> other cool stuff could we do? What, well, lots of people are now, you know, John Blanche is now uh, retired and, you know, Jez Goodwin, we'd love to have talked to Jez. John, I mean, there are lots of people. We couldn't talk to people who were currently employed by Games Workshop because they're covered yeah. by, um, you know, com confidentiality agreements, quite rightly too. Um, so we only ever talk to people who are no longer working for Workshop. But right, we've got yeah. a fantastic array of people. And the period that we're covering is from really the founding of Games Workshop through to that end of the 90s. Because after the Castle Boulevard move in 97 to Lenton, it, it's not that the game, Games Workshop stopped being so creative, but it became slightly more corporate. And the way I see it, between 83 and maybe 95, a 10 or 12 year period, everything that the company has worked with ever since was created and that's whether it's warhammer and 40k or space marine or necromunda or mordheim or battlefleet gothic or it, it was just an incredibly creative decade that happened there and maybe it's a magic period in every organization you know we, we now think think of the beatles actually 63 six, please please me to let it be was six years 63 okay. 69 and you yeah. go it's only six years six years Fellas, and that they'd known each other for a decade before then, but there were six public years in which they created stuff that has lasted forever. And you go, I, you, people go, really? You go, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have guessed it like that. Yeah, 60, wow. 60, 60, you know, please, please me to let it be with six years. And for Games Workshop, something like 83 to 93, 94, that was it. Mm -hmm. That's when the genius happened. And maybe genius only happens once. That's not to say that what Games Workshop isn't doing now isn't breathtaking in terms of their control of plastic and plastics technology and miniatures but the games are still adeptus titanicus and necromunda and warhammer and 40k and epic and it's the same yeah. stuff because yeah, it's so it great. Yeah. because it's so because that creativity of that magic golden spot of these people coming together was was magic and that's what we try and capture in the book Fantastic. Robin, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope the book is a fantastic success. I've, uh, as I said, very, very excited for my copy to arrive. And if it arrives in time before the open day, I will be bringing it along and trying to get some extra signatures if people Excellent. are around. Well, it should be, you should have it by early next week. I think the, the dispatch was starting today for the uh, pre-order. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding. If people love it, then I, I'm just delighted that if people have a great time with it and it, it helps cement their love of the hobby. Brilliant. Thank you very much again. It's fantastic. Been a pleasure.